Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm David Wu. Welcome to The Money Game, where we make actionable predictions about the big stories shaping the world today. If you're interested in making money, you're in the right place. If you're not, this program is designed for anyone who is interested in learning about what makes our world tick. Please subscribe at davidwuunbound.com if you haven't done so already. As a bonus, tomorrow we're launching a new weekly column to focus on the growing importance of the so-called Reddit traders. John Hopkinson, who joins us from Lorian Capital, will be the main author of the new column. John is one of the smartest people I know. John has a PhD in mathematics from the prestigious Massachusetts Institute of Technology. John started his Wall Street career at Goldman Sachs and worked for me briefly at Bank America before joining Lorian as a quantitative equity analyst. While I focus on fundamental themes, John will cover the non-fundamental dimensions of the market that include technicals, sentiment, positioning, and flows. John has developed a range of proprietary quantitative indicators that he will use to suggest stocks to buy and sell. I'm very, very excited by John's joining davidwombound.com. Please look out for his first piece tomorrow on your email. Now let's turn to the program this week. Today I'm going to focus on the U.S. debt ceiling, an issue that's slowly coming into focus but I expect to explode onto the front page of major newspapers in the next few weeks. This issue is not for the faint-hearted because it's difficult to understand as it involves many opaque aspects of the working of the U.S. political system. People don't know when to take it seriously because very often it is just a lot of hot air. I will try to simplify the issue by breaking it down into more digestible components. I will also tell you why I think this time it is serious, because it involves not just one, but two games of chicken. I continue to think that small cap stocks will be particularly vulnerable to the volatility that this issue will generate in the next month. The Americans invented the debt ceiling. In fact, the debt ceiling is as American as milkshake. In 1917, U.S. Congress introduced an aggregate limit for the level of total outstanding bonds that could be issued by the U.S. federal government. In theory, when the debt ceiling is reached, the U.S. federal government will have no choice but to either balance its book or to default on its existing liabilities. In practice, though, the U.S. has always raised the debt ceiling. In fact, it's done so 80 times since the 1960s. In fact, the last time the U.S. ran a budget surplus was back in 2001. Many people, including Janet Yellen, wants to get rid of the debt ceiling. Not me, though. I view the debt ceiling as being the only mechanism that ensures some kind of fiscal sanity for the United States, the issuer of the world's reserve currency. What we have here is a chart of the outstanding U.S. federal government debt. As you can see, it's currently just north of $28 trillion. You can also see that back in 2005, 15 years ago, it was only at $7 trillion. In other words, over the last 15 years, U.S. government debt has gone up by 400%, no less. In fact, with a big jump over the past year during COVID. You said, what's $28 trillion? There are 160 million working Americans. It's as though every single working American owes $175,000. Wow. You can see currently at $20 trillion, you know, we are literally inches away from breaching the $28.4 trillion debt ceiling. Meanwhile, the U.S. government is rapidly running out of cash. This is a chart of the cash balance of the account that the U.S. government holds with the Federal Reserve. Currently, as you can see, is about $200 billion, down sharply from the last three months. Jenna Yellen told us last week that basically she thinks this number is going to reach zero by October 18th. When the U.S. government runs out of cash, it can do one of two things. Number one, it can start cutting back spending, like stop milling out checks to Social Security recipients, old people, that is. Or they can default on their maturing liabilities. What do you think they're going to do? You know, politically, it's probably much easier for them to do 
the ladder. You know, I think this is the reason why the bond market is starting to get a little bit nervous. This is the reason why, if you look at yields on one month U.S. Treasury bills, it's been actually rising, you know, not so slowly over the last month in anticipation of the risk of a potential default. You might say, well, how is this even allowed to happen? Well, the culprit is called fiscal brinksmanship. Fiscal brinksmanship has become an important feature of American politics over the last decade, thanks to the Tea Party. Well, often it's just a lot of hot air, but sometimes it can have serious consequences. Washington's on the verge of another fiscal brinksmanship. The question you should be asking yourself, will this time be also hot air? Or should we be taking it seriously? Let's start by defining brinksmanship. What is brinksmanship? In game theory, brinksmanship is also called the game of chicken. My favorite example of the game of chicken is in the movie Rebel with Other Calls, starring James Dean, a movie that made James Dean famous, in fact. In a famous scene, James Dean playing a teenager, Jim, and his rival, Buzz, are playing this game, whereby they're both driving their cars towards a cliff. And the idea is that whoever jumps off his car first will be the, the loser, the chicken. A more typical characterization of the game of chicken is when you've got two drivers heading towards each other on a collision course. The idea is that whichever driver that swore first will be the loser, the chicken. So the game of chicken is this high stake game involving two seemingly reckless players. You might say, how is this game going to end? Or rather, how should the game end? Well, a very powerful idea in game theory is called the Nash Equilibrium, which is named after John Nash, a true genius, played by Russell Crowe in the movie A Beautiful Mind. Nash Equilibrium refers to the outcome of any game in which each player makes the best decision for herself based on what she thinks the other player is going to do. This is, by construction, a very stable equilibrium, and therefore, it is also the most likely outcome of any game. It turns out, in the natural equilibrium of the game of chicken, one of the two players will swerve his card before the crash. In other words, nobody dies. However, it is impossible to know which player will swerve and when will this happen. In fact, what makes this game scary is the fact that if both players rightly believe each other being reasonable, in other words, do not want to die, they might decide to hold out for as long as possible. In fact, you can probably see by now that there's a very strong incentive in the game of chicken for each player to try to convince the other player that he's absolutely mad, that he's crazy, that he would rather die than to lose. This is probably the reason why Donald Trump was the greatest player ever to play the game of chicken, because he constantly keeps his opponent guessing as to whether he's really crazy or he's just playing crazy. So what's fiscal brinksmanship? Now, fiscal brinksmanship means different things to different people. For my purpose, I'm referring to a negotiation between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, whereby the cost of not reaching agreement is either a government shutdown or worse, a government default. It feels to me a new round of fiscal brinksmanship is set to break out next week in Washington. So what are the parameters of this game? On one side, you've got the Democrats. They want to pass a $3.5 trillion social spending bill that many people describe as the biggest expansion in U.S. welfare system in recent memory. On the other side, you've got the Republican Party that wants to do everything to stop the Democrats from basically pushing through this bill. So what do the Democrats bring to the table in terms of leverage? Well, they have total control of the House of Representatives. Number two, even though they only have 50 seats in the Senate, they enjoy an effective majority simply because U.S. Constitution allows the Vice President to vote in order to break a tie. And finally, okay, the so-called reconciliation process allows the Democrats to pass the bill with 
just a simple majority in the Senate. Now, what about the Republicans? What leverage do they have to stop the Democrats? Well, you know what? They can withhold their votes, okay, for raising the debt ceiling. And that is a very important weapon, their only weapon right now. We're two weeks away from the U.S. government actually running out of cash. So far, the Republican Party are standing steadfast, okay, behind their refusal to give their votes to raising the debt ceiling. So the question is, what can the Democrats do at this point? Essentially, it comes down to just two simple options. The Democrats can either dare the Republicans to follow through with their threats, or the Democrats can try to get around the Republicans by using the reconciliation to raise the debt ceiling. There's one little problem with trying to dare the Republicans to follow through with their threat, and that is Biden's approval rating. As you probably know, Biden's approval rating has collapsed over the last two months. It is now sitting just higher than that of Trump's in the September of the first year of the last 10 presidents in office. While what this means is that if basically the U.S. does default, the voters are much more likely to blame the president, the Democratic Party, something the Democratic Party cannot afford at this point, obviously. There's also a little problem with option two of trying to raise the debt ceiling using the reconciliation process. And that is the fact that rec reconciliation can only be used once a year, which is to say that unless the Democrats are prepared to forfeit their social spending bill, they'll have to basically combine raising the debt ceiling with you know, the social spending bill in the same recon reconciliation process, which makes the whole process much more unwieldy. You might say, why don't they just basically put off the social spending bill until the next fiscal year? Well, the problem is that the next fiscal year doesn't start until September 2022, by which time you're talking about one month away from the all important midterm elections, by which time it will be too late. To make it easier to visualize this game, I've written out the decision tree for the game. As you can see here, what we got in the first step is the Republicans threatening to basically give their support for raising the debt ceiling. The Democrats therefore have two options. In option one, they dare the Republicans to follow through their threats. You know, there are only two outcomes from that. Either the Republicans capitulate, this obviously will be a big win for the Democrats, or that the Republicans don't capitulate. And then you end up with the Democrats capitulating, or you end up with a default, neither of which is good for the Democrats, okay? So therefore, doing option one seems a very risky strategy. That leaves you with option two, okay? Trying to essentially pass it through reconciliation. But there, okay, the only option, the viable option is trying to combine obviously, the, the raising the debt ceiling with the social spending bill in the same reconciliation. This, in fact, seems to be the only way out for the Democrats. However, this only way out for the Democrats require party unity, which is missing at the moment. In fact, the progressive wing of the party and the centrists are currently at war over the size of the social spending bill. You've got the progressives who are demanding $3.5 trillion as a minimum, basically, uh, size of the package. They view it already as a dramatic slimming down of their campaign promises. On the other, you've got centrists like Senator Manchin, okay, who's concerned about the impact of such a big bill on debt sustainability, on future growth opportunity. And he has said last week that he will not go further than $1.5 trillion. Things have gotten so bad between the progressives and the centrists within the Democratic Party that they're now playing basically their own game of chicken. In fact, the progressives over the last few weeks have repeatedly refused to vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill that the centrists support unless the centrists agree to the $3.5 trillion price tag. 
This is the reason why the vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill has been delayed and then again and again. The lack of party unity among the Democrats reduces the potential outcomes of this game. They still have the option of daring the Republicans to trigger default. But for them to actually raise the debt ceiling and pass the social spending bill using the same reconciliation process, they now have to agree on a much smaller social spending plan, one that actually satisfies the demand of the centrists. Over the next two weeks, we'll be seeing these two games of chicken basically being played out with unpredictable outcomes. Now, I don't think, okay, we're going to see an actual default. Well, God forbid we should, okay? But I certainly think that we could be heading towards a protracted period of policy uncertainty that weighs on business confidence and consumer confidence that should be viewed as being financial market negative. Now, a more likely resolution of this crisis is that the Democrats scale back dramatically on their $3.5 trillion social spending plan. Let's just say they go to $1.5 trillion, okay? This will likely mean that it's going to be fiscal neutral to the extent it's more likely than not that it's going to be funded by higher capital gains tax, higher personal income tax, and higher corporate tax. And I'm not sure that's going to be market positive either, especially given, as I said before, there's not going to be much of a stimulus dimension. It's going to be higher taxes funding welfare. I don't think market is going to like that too much either. Brinksmanship is a dangerous game to play at a time of great division. Last week, we got the results of a new University of Virginia survey that found that 52% of Trump voters saying that they're in favor of seceding, okay, from the union to form their own separate country. And 41% of Biden voters saying the same. This is what really is at stake right now. If the Democrats manage to push through this $3.5 trillion social spending plan, it will represent such a basically massive change in the direction of the country that I think it would only accelerate the move towards secession, especially among states like Texas and Florida. The debt ceiling crisis that I foresee over the next few weeks cannot possibly come at a, a worse time because it will be happening just as U.S. consumers get ready for the Christmas shopping. Given consumer confidence has already been slipping, in fact, towards the lowest level since the beginning of COVID, I think increased volatility, uncertainty about a potential default could potentially basically make it a very tough holiday season for American retailers. I've been saying this for a while and I'll say it again. I think small cap stocks are particularly vulnerable to a debt ceiling basically crisis. For one thing that small cap stocks are overvalued and moreover an economic downturn following such a shock would be particularly basically bad news for small cap stocks. A lot of things have happened over the last few weeks. I want to give you a quick update of my evolving outlook for the major themes and my trading view. On COVID, the big story last week, of course, was you know, Merck's announcement that they have successfully developed a drug, okay, for treating COVID patients that reduces hospitalization and deaths by as much as 50%. This is welcome news, okay, and should be viewed as being very bullish for the global economy, at least over the medium term, to the extent that it reduces the need for draconian shutdown in the future. As much as there's still a lot about this drug that we don't know about, it has temper some of my pessimism about the longer term impact of COVID. I will certainly be following the story closely. The Merck news has not changed my mind, however, about the need for a third booster, at least in the short term, especially for the US. Okay, I've been telling you over the last month that the United States, by virtue of the fact it was among the first countries to vaccinate its population, 
population will be naturally the first to experience the waning effectiveness of the vaccines. In fact, if you look at this chart here, you know, over the next four weeks, about 30% of Americans, that is about 50% of people who have full vaccination are at risk of seeing the protection afforded by their vaccines wearing off. Israel, which was the first country to complete basically vaccinating 50% of its population, have been giving out the third booster to anybody who wants one over the last six weeks. Consequently, we're starting to see the strategy paying off as the number of new cases has been tumbling over the last basically two weeks. In contrast, the de decision by the FDA two weeks ago that they would only give out the third booster to people over 65, I think that basically puts the U.S. in a tough position, especially as we go into the fall, when the schools have reopened, when the weather gets colder, and when the flu season begins in earnest. The Merck news has not changed my mind about the short-term outlook for wage growth and inflation. In fact, I will be looking for more signs of wage pressure building in the U.S. September job numbers that will be released next Friday. As you can see on this chart here, the wage pressure has been accelerating over the last basically three months to a level that we haven't seen since the beginning of COVID. In fact, the chart also basically just tells you to what extent the Fed is behind the curve. And I think from that point of view, another set of strong wage growth number is going to put the Fed basically on its back foot. And I think that's going to basically make the rates market very nervous, you know, even, you know, basically notwithstanding the debt ceiling crisis that I see unfolding over the next few weeks. The U.S. dollar has been the biggest beneficiary of the repricing of U.S. interest rates over the last two, three weeks. In fact, you can see here on this slide here, euro dollar looks like it's formed a double top slash, you know, head and shoulder pattern. It would seem that the dollar rally is not over. In fact, I would argue that if you get another strong set of wage growth number, I think, you know, euro could be at risk of losing another two to three percent against the green bond. In the interest of transparency, I'm going to work harder to make it easier for you guys to track my calls. Okay, this is it. Pfizer, as you know, I've been basically making the case that Pfizer is a good way to play for, you know, the third booster. With this recent decline, it's now entering into my buy zone. I would put in a buy order at $42 a share. Okay, as I just told you, U.S. September job numbers could provide a further boost to the dollar. So will, by the way, you know, essentially the debt ceiling noise, ironically, that could be viewed as bullish for the dollar to the extent it represents contractionary policy on the part of the U.S. I will basically sell euro dollar at the open on Monday. Okay. As I've been saying, small cap stocks will be vulnerable to both debt ceiling volatility as well as to potential resurgence of COVID cases. I will short sell IWM, which is the ETF for Russell 2000, at the close on Monday. China slowdown, I think that will continue and that will ultimately basically be bad news for Western basically retailers with significant exposure to Chinese consumers. In particular, I would want to basically sell Richemont at open on Monday. Okay, with that, talk to you guys next week.